Good evening. Welcome to the Gateway House weekly webcast. I'm Manjeet Kripalani, Executive Director of Gateway House. We have with us today a very, very special person, Dexter Roberts, or Tiff Roberts, as we call him, who has a 23-year career of reporting on China from China, uh, and he has just returned. Tiff and I were colleagues at Business Week. He was the bureau chief in Beijing, and I was the bureau chief in India. We would joke that while the European bureaus of the magazine had multiple reporters covering populations of you know, 25 million, Tiff and I had the task of single-handedly covering the economies, politics, and societies of over 1 billion people each. Tiff has seen China firsthand, and instead of staying in the cities, he spent time in the rural heartlands of China, covering peasants, migrants, coal mine workers, young Chinese, the Communist Party workers at the ground level. He has seen the rise of militant China and of digital China. After 23 years, he has come to this conclusion, which is the title of his new book, The Myth of Chinese Capitalism, The Worker, The Factory, and the Future of the World. You couldn't have put it better, Tiff. China is the center of the universe, and it's enjoying its attention as also misusing it. Its rise changed geopolitics and trade starting two decades ago. And again now, in 2020, its rise is changing geopolitics and trade again. All of India is having a crash course on China these days. So you are going to be our teacher today, Tiff. Let's just get down to it. Um, I'm going to request, we're going to have 15 minutes Q&A with, with Tiff. And then I request everybody to put your audience Q&A on the chat box and we will take it as and how. So welcome. Tiff, right away, the title of your book, Why Do You Call Chinese capital, Capitalism a Myth? State ownership as versus straight private ownership? Is there more to it? Well, uh, thank you, first of all, Manjeet, and thank you to Gateway House. I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, so yes, the, the myth of Chinese capitalism in the title of my book, um, what do I mean by Chinese capitalism here? Uh, broadly speaking, Chinese capitalism is shorthand for economic reform. And whereas China uh, did have very real economic reform and is behind this tremendous surge in growth and the rise in living standards throughout the country uh, and, and went on for many years and many of the years that I was based in China uh, as a business and economics reporter, my argument is that that uh, reform has now really stalled, if not outright stopped. And we're seeing uh, that particularly over the last five plus years under the present leadership of uh, President and Party Secretary Xi Jinping. And so the myth is that there's no capitalism at all. It just doesn't so, exist or it only exists for the party. So uh, if you ultimately, uh, I mean, first of all, China does have a you know, very substantial ecosystem of private entrepreneurs and private companies. And, uh, and they had been doing very well over the years and many of the, uh, over the last few decades and particularly over the last 10, 10 plus years. But what we've seen is a real reversal in, the, in their standing within the economy. And one of the arguments I make in my book is that even though China does have a significant number of private entrepreneurs and private enterprises, ultimately uh, they uh, will really only function uh, with the goodwill of the Chinese Communist Party. And that is something that has become much, far more true over this last five or six years. Uh, every successful Chinese private entrepreneur in China knows that if they reach a certain size and a certain level of success, they have really two responsibilities. One is the traditional responsibility of making money, turning a profit, uh, and, and so on. The other really is a political one, and that is making sure that their uh, corporate goals align with those of the Chinese Communist Party. Wow, that's, uh, that's, that's big. Um, you have also dedicated, so going from there to your dedication in your book, which is to the migrant workers of China and to their families. That's a contrast to the capitalism you refer to. Tell us about the two Chinas you saw, the China of entrepreneurs and the China of rural migrants, and why the two have not and may not ever meet. 
So yeah, uh, uh, the my book does focus to a large degree on this other China, for lack of a better uh, way to describe them. And this is a very substantial portion of the population of China. Uh, I, I'm writing about the migrants, which number around 300 million people, which you know, just to note is a you know, a larger pop larger than uh, uh, you know roughly the same, perhaps a bit larger than the U.S. population. And then there are relatives in the countryside, which is another 300 million or mo or more uh, people. Together, that group of the other China uh, encompasses about half the population of China. Another myth that I talk about in my book is that China will continue to keep growing its middle class under its present system uh, the way that it has so, done so, so, so successfully in previous years. And uh, what I talk again about in my book is a, uh, an actual system built into the Chinese economy that ensures that this other China of migrants and their rural cousins are in effect second class citizens. This prevents them from becoming part of a future middle class in China. And why has that happened? Because, I mean, communism was supposed to be about the people, not about the middle class. And China already eliminated all its middle class. Well, this is, this is one of the great ironies of the communist revolution in China, which is not always recognized. And that is that going all the way back to the Mao era, to Mao Zedong, there was a system put in place that really divided China into two major classes. And one class was uh, those people who lived in the city, the urbanites, who were seen as very important in uh, Mao's goal then of industrialization. And he was borrowing a leaf from from uh, Stalin at that point. And uh, so even as he talked about a revolution for the people, the reality was he needed, uh, in order to drive industrialization, he needed a very large population, in effect, a captive population of rural people in order to, to uh, uh, provide cheap food uh, for the people in the cities that were going to build industrialization, at least in his plan. Uh, what's happened today is even with the reform, certain key policies that Mao put in place that created this dual uh, China are still there. And uh, they're actually been behind the economic miracle of this made for China, uh, 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 made, uh, made in China uh, manufacturing miracle that has produced these low cost exports for the world. A large degree based on this system, which keeps migrants and rural people in this second class status and ensured low wages in China for many years. And also, you have mentioned in your book, in fact, you've talked about it a lot, that, that the, the coastal elites have benefited from the hard work of these migrants who have actually not benefited at all. Uh, can you tell us something about that? How, is that? how has that happened? Well, again... In the schools, it, it, in, the, in the wages? Yes. So uh, you do see, uh, in, uh, broadly speaking, you see in China, again, this, uh, this division into th those people that are born in the countryside um, and those people that are born in the cities. And the way that they, in effect, are discriminated against is through something called the household registration policy, which is a Mao era policy, but one that is still very much alive and well today. And that policy, in effect, ensures that those people that are from the countryside or whose parents are from the countryside uh, do not get the same access to uh, medical care, do not get their children, do not get the same access to affordable pu public schools that those people from the cities get. And um, it's interesting if you look at some of even look at some of even the protests that we've seen in China in recent years, uh, we've seen protests by urbanites who have actually pushed back against efforts by the well-meaning efforts by the government to try to integrate migrants and rural people more into the economy. So you have this interesting dynamic where urban people are uh, very protective and not surprisingly so of the privileges that they have in the system and do not want to see reforms that, although necessary perhaps to drive future economic growth, uh, in, the, in the immediate term mean they have to share their, their hospitals and their schools with the, with the other half of China. And so this has created uh, an unequal society. 
it's deeply unequal. And, and again, I don't know how much this is widely known, but China today has one of the most unequal societies in the world. If you look at it by the traditional Gini coefficient, it is very, very high. The other thing that's, a, that's quite striking in China is the growth in, in the wealth gap. And we've seen, and the re research by uh, Thomas Piketty, the noted inequality scholar, and a, a gentleman named Gabriel Zuckman at Berkeley have looked at inequality in China. And what they find is uh, that inequality and the wealth gap has grown at a rate comparable to what we've seen in Russia, which is somewhat surprising. We don't usually associate uh, kleptocratic Russia, as people have called it, with uh, China today. But, but that is the reality. Yeah. Um, let's go back to who or what really made China what it is, and that's really the United States. So you were eyewitness to how the U.S. helped and enabled China to join the WTO in 2001, thereby bringing it into the global community. China is, in a sense, a child of U.S.-led efforts. Um, can you elaborate on those efforts? Because you've, you've written about it a lot. Um, and very few people know how much the US, Japan, Europe, the UK helped China become what it is today. Yes, I should start by saying that many Chinese, uh, uh, they're, they're, they, were, they're, they might react strongly, particularly today in China. There's, there's uh, not a lot of appreciation for, uh, uh, the, particularly with the, the antagonist relationship with the US, rec uh, recognizing any role that the US may have played. But it is a fact, yes, that, uh, I mean, I was there uh, throughout the whole WTO accession process, and uh, the key agreement uh, was the US-China bilateral accession agreement, which was signed in uh, 1999. The, uh, the main negotiator on the US side was very capable uh, former head of USTR, Charlene Barshevsky, and uh, it was very interesting to see that whole process. And it was very much a give and take where both sides, um, uh, particularly with China, they had to open up all these different markets uh, from agriculture to telecoms to finance. We've seen uh, a mixed record on progress on meeting some of the promised WTO commitments all these years later. But nevertheless, uh, there was this give and take where uh, the U.S. would open up its uh, access to its market. Um, obviously, a huge flow of foreign investment, a huge flow of American investment came into China, uh, which helped not only pro provide financing at this key moment almost 20 years ago, but also uh, managerial know-how which really uh, helped transform the Chinese economy as well. So I think it is fair to say that the U.S. and some other uh, major economies as well, Japan and so on, did play a very crucial role in this economic transformation. You have to, you have to keep in mind that uh, before WTO and right shortly after I arrived in China in the mid-90s, um, it was very much still a state-dominated uh, economy. It's returning to become a state-dominated economy in some ways, but at that time there really wasn't a private, uh, a, a private enterprise uh, portion of the economy that was flourishing. And uh, uh, it was quite dramatic. I remember as a young reporter writing about the auto industry, the first thing we had to know was 85% of auto sales went to the government or to large state enterprises. So there was no real uh, private auto market to speak of at all back then. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a, what a journey it's been for China and for the world. Um, and which brings me next to China's world domination quest. Is it a Xi Jinping quest? Or do ordinary Chinese truly believe that their time has come? Are they isolated in their, in their own technology and state propaganda bubble? Or do they really understand the world very well? I think that I think the answer to that question is really both, in the sense that I, I, I'm I'm cheating by saying not, not not coming down on one side. But the reality is, your average Chinese uh, does feel, uh, of course, real national pride, and they do feel like this is a moment for China to take a much larger uh, role on the global stage. On the other hand, uh, how that uh, role, what that role will be will be going forward is very much being defined by Xi Jinping and by the senior members of the Communist Party. And um, so uh, I, I think that the, the uh, uh, so I think you can say both are there. I, I do think as well, um, it's, it's uh, uh, no, be no surprise to many of you that 
The Chinese education system is still very tightly controlled by the party. Under Xi Jinping, it has become more tightly controlled. There's been a, uh, the, the trend has been towards more closing rather than opening, uh, less access to information, a stronger and stronger firewall to try to block out what they perceive as unfriendly or unwelcome information. And again, in the education system, we've seen a growing emphasis on teaching ideology at younger and younger ages. So you've got primary school kids that are learning Xi Jinping slogans and memorizing various party slogans. And so, uh, so again, both Manji, a very good question. Uh, there is real pride by the people. They would like to see China to take a much larger role, but that role and the, the, ra the rather bellicose belligerent version that we're seeing now around right. the world, which is alarming to countries everywhere, including India, of course, is very much being defined by Xi Jinping and the senior members of the Communist Party. Okay, and bringing it closer to home in India, um, the CCP, Chinese Communist Party versus the People's Liberation Army. Are they, are they one, are they fused, are they separate? Do they know what they're doing? Because the Chinese will often say, oh, the border issue is a, is a PLA, you know, rogue PLA element. And then of course we know it's not. Yeah, no, I think that's really uh, not true. I think that's uh, an excuse, if anything, uh, for what's happening. But uh, what I would say is uh, the decisions by local army units to act in the way that they do is very much driven by vision at the top. And if China says, if the top leadership and Xi Jinping say, uh, guess what, these borders, uh, we're not so sure we want to stick with the status quo. We want to push to have a, we want to push a bit here. That's coming from the very top of the leadership. And of course, what we've seen in India is a very good example of it, but we've also seen it in the South China Sea. We've also seen it uh, with PLA flights uh, crossing this unofficial midway line in the Taiwan Strait, testing the Taiwanese Air Force. Uh, we've seen it with uh, their relationship with Vietnam. And so we've seen it in, in many, many places. I think it's, I think it's uh, absolutely untrue to say that these are rogue PLA elements and therefore the party somehow can pretend like uh, they're, they're not fully responsible. I don't think that's the case. And the last question, um, because I know there's a lots and lots of other questions. Back to um, economics and capitalism. So Chinese digital companies are now shifting away from listing in the US uh, and to listing at home. And until two weeks ago, they were all going to Hong Kong, but now, you know, maybe that's just no longer possible. First, um, will they get good valuations? And second, with Hong Kong less attractive, where are they going to go? Are Shanghai and Shenzhen good options? I think I mean, longer term, we've been hearing for years, almost since, I, almost since I arrived in China, that Shanghai and Shenzhen are going to be built up to become viable alternatives to Hong Kong and other markets around the world. Uh, the progress has been very slow and, uh, you know, it gets to the heart of China's, uh, the, the leadership and the system in China's control over capital and uh, the fact that, um, you know, they can't, it's difficult to have a flourishing uh, stock market when, when you know m much of the financial system through the banks is still state controlled and they and they have strong capital controls because they're concerned about uh capital flight out of the country so um i think it's going to take a while for quite a while for shanghai or shenzhen to play a real role replacing a market like hong kong people have talked about singapore i don't think um i don't think singapore is a viable alternative for hong kong either i also think hong kong uh, I'm sorry, I also think that the government in China, as a priority, would like to see it closer to home. There's a, there's a very strong interest in their mind to having their top companies list in a market that they control, which is Hong Kong. But then, then it gets to the question of, uh, you know, killing the, the, the goose with the golden yeah. eggs. They, they want to control it, but they also want it to be a viable, attractive international market that appeals to uh, kind of companies from around the world, not just Chinese companies. And therein lies their conflict. Yes. Therein lies the same thing, the myth of uh, capitalism. Yes. Okay, yeah. I'm going to start with a few questions and until I'm going to get to them in a second. But lastly, the Belt and Road ambi uh, Ambitious Initiative. How much has that been damaged by current uh, events? And how is Xi Jinping going to salvage his pet project and can he? 
Well, I think it's definitely been damaged. And there was some research that came out in the last few weeks from the government that said that a very significant portion of projects, Belt and Road projects, had been put on hold because of COVID-19 in particular. And, uh, um, and then, of course, we're also seeing this growing pushback against uh, China's uh, more, uh, I, I would call it belligerent stance towards the world, which, makes, which has an impact on the degree which companies I'm sorry, the degree to which countries are, are welcoming of these big projects. So I do think it, it, there has been an impact. Uh, it, as, you, as you just mentioned, it very much is a pet project of Xi Jinping. And so it's very important. Anything that Xi Jinping says is important is yeah. going to be very important for China, at least for the time being. And so I do think that it's not going to go away. And he will do his very best to try to resurrect it, even in the face of this adversity from COVID-19 and also from a bit of a pushback from the rest of the world on, on, on China's assertive global presence.